I'm sorry, dear. I don't mean to go flat on you. Are you talking about um, Amber um, K? Amber. Yes, thank you. Amber, Amber K. Amber K. Yeah. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to Invoking the Red Goddess. I'm your hostess, Snappy, and I'm joined by my good friend, Buffy. And today, we're going to be interviewing Elder Witch and Coven Mother Mariah. How are you, Mariah? Oh, glad I can be with you guys. Amazing to have you. Mariah, you're joining us all the way from Holland, right? Yes, ma'am. I live in a little bitty town called Amersdal. Oh, it's beautiful. inland from Rotterdam, about 70 miles up river. Amazing. So Buffy introduced me to you, and you were a huge inspiration in her life, one of the people who introduced her to magic and to witchcraft and all of this pra uh, practice. So we wanted to take the time to talk to you and hear about your experiences, and you've had quite the colorful and magical life. So... Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, and um, do you have any early experiences with magic from back then? Oh, dear. Uh, good. I was born in Illinois. When I was six or seven, my mom and dad, we moved, we all moved to California, and that was the first trip that I ever took. I saw the first that I ever saw was the Pacific, and we went to the Grand Canyon and the Meteor Crater. So all those things have been way back in my childhood. Then the summer that I was seven, we went to, back to Illinois to visit my grandparents and I fell and broke my arm very badly. I was in a cast for oh, almost a year, but it healed up and it worked out okay. After that, um, my, mom, my dad was involved. He knew Ron Hubbard of the uh, Scientology thing. Oh, really? And my mother was, yeah, and she was involved with a thing in at uh, Southern California near San Diego called Quest Haven, which I think is still there. I, I found it on the internet, but I don't know much about it. Some kind of a spiritual center. Interesting. So anyway, both your got... parents were in, involved in sort of alternative spirituality and alternative psychology then? Yes. And my, both of their fathers, my mother's father and my father's father, are 32nd degree Masons, or were they both gone? Interesting. I, so, you know, that might have had some kind of play into that at that point. I don't know for sure. But then they got, my mom and dad got divorced. And uh, we moved on the train to St. Petersburg, Florida, where my, her dad had just retired and moved. So I crossed the continent when I was, I think I was about eight and was amazed when we stepped off. We had to change trains in, in New Orleans. And I got off the train, and it had been a nice air-conditioned train for three days. Walked up through that door into the heat of New Orleans and thought I was going to go over. It was like walking into a solid wall. Huh? Oh, wow. Yeah, I can imagine the heat would just be so intense. <laughs> So you moved across the country. Where where did you guys wind up moving again? Did we lose her? I think we may have. Yeah, she might be back. We'll give it a minute. No problem. Okay. I'm just going to blow my nose for one second here, okay? Okay. Yeah, it looks like we lost her. <laughs> Poor lady. Mercury. Oh, my God. We may have to call her back. She may call yeah, me. Yeah, it looks like it. All right, let me call you back. Oh, there we go. Or what? Are you there? We lost you for a good bit. I'm here. Yeah, I may leave that in there, too, and cut out, like, a lot of the stuff, but be like, oh, we lost her. Oh, there she is. <laughs> I didn't heard of the, a word of that i didn't even know you were gone yeah well we were okay. riding the wave of mercury retrograde oh right yeah well, how far did, did you get that you want to keep well we heard you were you were talking and we lost you right around you you were talking about orleans and getting off the train and experiencing the heat 
Oh, yeah. And that's where we lost you. Okay. Uh, most of the rest of it wasn't terribly important. I talked a little about the harmonica band, but that wasn't really pagan. I guess the next thing, my, my uh, mother was very abusive. And she, by the time I was out of high school, she said, you're going to go to good, good jobs. So I was hunting, desperately hunting for a job. And I come home one hot day from hunting, and she said, I found you a job. And I said, oh. She says, yeah, you're going to be in the Air Force. And I went, say what? She had gone down to the recruiting office and signed me in. And I had no call, no call in the matter at all. I was gone. So That's literally awful. sold me down the river. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, it turned out all right. I met my first husband uh, on Life KP. Has a way, right? Yeah, in Orlando. You know, where we, we were at Orlando Air Base, that was Woody, and he's the father of all five of my children, who are mostly, I think at least half of them are pagan still. I, mean, I don't think any are not, let's put it that way. We got married. Uh, I was I was thought bad about being pregnant, which I was, and uh, they didn't, the Air Force didn't want me anymore, so they gave me a, dis, a discharge and, and paid my way my air over to Germany where I joined up with Woody. We were here about a year and a half. My oldest son was born in Germany. But then after oh, that, we came in. Huh? I said interesting, sorry. Uh, <laughs> then we went back to St. Petersburg and we were here, there, and otherwise we went to California, here, there, and, you know, over the years and stuff finally didn't work out. I was in a Tampa by myself working for a surveyor and back with this new thing about the bridge coming down, you know, in, in Maryland. I was in St. Petersburg working at the Tampa Bay shipyards when the bridge, when the ship hit the Sunshine Skyway Bridge and brought it down and 30-something people died. Oh, scary. Greyhound bus went off the off it, and a, 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 a truck, a pickup truck fell from the bridge onto the deck of the ship. I don't know what all, but it was a mess. And it sure brought that all back. Sure heard that about that a couple, couple weeks ago. Crazy. Was, yeah, it was. It was quite a deal. But it was, and, and that, well, that's one of the firmest, famous people I met. The guy that owned the shipyard was George Strain, Steinbrenner, the owner of the New York Yankees. So I met him. Wow, that's was a, 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 kind of a him. snob. <laughs> huh? Kind of a snob? Oh, God. Yeah, he, he, wasn't, he, was, he was friendly, but, you know, I was an employee at that point, and, you know. Of course. Yeah. So there in Tampa, I met a few people that were sort of into it, and I really didn't know much about it, but I later we moved to Atlanta, and I had... That some of the people that I met in, in Florida had moved to Atlanta, so I got up with them and started going to some festivals and this here, no, here and there. Pretty soon decided it was the thing that made the most sense that I had ever found, and I had done a good deal of reading on about Buddhism and Confucianism and Islam and everything I could get my hands on. And had to find anything that really fit me, but that did. That's so I just kind of stuck there. So, what were these festivals like that you found to be so inspiring? Like, what 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 happened at these kind of events? And were they like specifically pagan or more like hippie uh, orientated? The, the, well, I've been to three different categories. And I've been to very pagan gatherings. I've been to very traditional Native American gatherings. And, uh, what was the third one? Damn it. Oh, just more like stuff. hippie stuff, more young people. Yeah, oriented. Yeah, yeah. I went to three or four of the national rainbow gatherings. I went to Texas, went to Wyoming, oh, went to Georgia. Yeah, it was at least three of those. Oh, and I went to the one in Kentucky. So I've been to four of those. They had that every year on the 4th of July. Oh, wow. That was a blast. So, was it more gradual yeah. for you then, the spiritual yeah. awakening, or was there any kind of event? Or like memory that you can you can trace some of this back to. No, nothing specific. Just like this, the people that I just kept seeing to be beating here and there, you know. So it's almost and, like the colorfulness of Atlanta itself was yeah. an inspiration. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 
Like you had sent me a picture when I was going through some of the pictures you sent me. You sent me this interesting picture of this man you called the Sarfant. Can you talk about this person and how you met them? Uh, yeah, he. I met him through Ravenwood, and he was later married to Lady Rhiannon. I understand, but he, we, we were never more than just you know friends and buddies. But he was erudite, if you like the word. He, he always had questions answers for the questions and questions for your answers and he was one of those people that you learned a lot from just from being around i lost track of him over the years and moving around and so forth did manage to find that one picture of him (laughs) yeah he seems like quite the mystic from what i've from what i've seen which is an interesting character so yeah yeah why don't you talk to us a little bit about um, Ravenwood and how you, you first were introduced to Ravenwood? Uh, I came up to Ravenwood with a friend, a fellow that I was dating in St. Petersburg, or actually in Tampa. And he had found out about this place and came up because there was going to be a gathering in a Georgia State Park. So we came up and... Uh, had got he had got a hold of Lady Lady Satana. She said, "Well, we can stay there for a couple of days for the festival thing." She was going to be at that with her group, and so we went to this gathering, and that's where I met uh, Oberon Zell. Come to think of it, was it? No, that was wow. at a later. One. That was at a later one. It was same place, same place though. Interesting. But anyway, I liked the way she did things, and I liked the people of her group that we met that that week. And so I just kind of thought, well, it was just neat. But the guy that I had got up there with, we were like fuming, and he threatened to leave. I said, go ahead, I'll stay here. Santana says, sure. So I moved in with her, and gosh, I stayed there over a year, I guess. I met the next fellow that I married, John Underwood, and we, through him, I we finally met a girl at oh it was at Ravenwood too where we met the lady that was a mason and I jumped at her because all my life I'd been at my both my grandfathers well how come I can't be a mason because you're a girl I said well damn that <laughs> you know watch me I will and I did wow so, and, so tell me about your experiences with masonry then so you met this person at this Ravenwood gathering and she was a Freemason. She was, she was, she was a girl from England. I can't remember her name. I can see her face. She had beautiful red hair. And she had been in masonry for a long time. Told us about this particular tradition where you can, you know, you could be a a woman. And so when they started a a lodge there in Atlanta, John and I jumped at it. And he... I heard later went on to become master of the lodge, which was cool. I had moved on after several, couple more, three, three years. I was there. It took me just over a year to become from an editor to Mr. Master Mason, which was a man. I really enjoyed it. The master when I was there was a, a retired rear admiral. He was a riot. And his wife was also a member, and they were the sweetest people, and they were always doing so so much for all the brothers. So, what's your perspective overall of masonry then? Because you know, masonry has a kind of a colored, um, you know, history within the world and within occultism, and people tend to be very, you know, polarized <laughs> when 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 it becomes mentioned. As as a woman and as someone who actually became a member, what do you make of it? I think it's like any other of the ancient knowledges. They have some of the answers and not all of them, but they do a hell of a lot of good for a lot of people in, all over the world. And I can't fault about that for anything. I mean, they have children's hospitals and I don't know what all that are, you know, totally free if the child needs something. Oh, and here's a story about masonry. There's a thing that you're supposed to, a sign that you show and something that you say if you need help. Kind of like, oh, over here now, (laughs) me. And John and I were living in the north of Atlanta and he had a job and he got in the car with his buddy and drove off to work one day and he called me. I'm in jail. I said, what? He said, well, it turns out that I can't even remember the guy's name. He had some stolen goods in the back of the car. I got stopped for a traffic ticket. And, of course, 
John being in the car, the cops arrested both of them. Well, after he called me, I said, see what you can find out. Find out if anybody there, any of the, the cops or, or the, or the you know, and if anybody's a Mason, he said, I'll let you go. So he called me back about an hour and he said, yes, the, the police, the chief of police is a Mason. I said, oh, okay, what's his name? What's his phone number? So I called him and I said the words. And he said, oh, uh, what did you say? And I repeated it. He said, you did say that. I said, yes. He said, oh, what's the name? Oh, I said, explained it all and you know that John was a Mason and he wouldn't was not and, and would not be involved in anything and he was out of jail in less than an hour and I've never had to use it since but I was glad at that time I had I knew that so wild you hear these kind of stories every once in a while but it's interesting to hear from someone I'm, I'm, I'm talking to directly that's that's power wow yeah it was and it, it really it, it felt so good that what they told me was true, you know. If you, if you, you know, stand out in the middle of the highway and have a wreck or something, just make these sign and face and holler this, and somebody will come out of the woodwork because they have had promise to. And boy, let me tell you, those Masonic, Masonic promises cut no mustard. If right. I do not, if if I don't, and if I don't live up my to my order, my whatever, I can't think of the words now, but in too many years but if i don't live all the all, all of this may they bury me at low tide up to my neck and something else but anyway you were sure to not right if if you if you crossed what the promises you, that you made as a mason so it was you know it's pretty but it was there when i needed it and i was so glad and i can imagine friend, both my granddads died before that happened. Unfortunately, I didn't ever get a chance to tell them that I was, you know. But I remember Elmer, my mother's father, had always said that he he, he thought it would be great if I could be a Mason. But uh, anyway. <laughs> well, you see that goal. That's beautiful. Yeah, I did. And uh, also, about that same time, the early 80s, there was a club they called the Universal Life Church. I don't know if you've heard of them or not. Yeah. But they were they were just starting. He what? I said, what's your perspective on the Universal Life Church? I'm one of their ministers and have been. Since oh, wow. Started. Yeah. Did you ever never, get to meet like Kirby Hensley or any of the people who founded they, it? No, okay. I, no, I didn't. But I, I knew of them, of course. And we were, of uh, we, 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 if you were a minister, you were allowed to do perform marriages and those kind of things. So I married my oldest son to his first wife at a big pagan gathering. And it was so. I I did just send you with those pictures. I will. It didn't okay. come out. But uh, and that was. I thought that was neat. And he is still very pagan. I don't know whatever happened to her. But. So with the Universal Life Church, their most famous thing is sort of that belief in what is right in the ability to pursue what is right as an individual. What do you think of that doctrine? Uh, it's not to say that I'm still part of their organization, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I guess maybe one of the things that came out of, out of my childhood was if I find something that works, I'll do it. If it doesn't work, I don't care for 10 seconds. And then and the, the, thing I think of with, with, the other thing I think of about with Kerb, with, with Hensley was that he had this belief in reincarnation and the reunification of all religions and believed that there was like this continual kind of knowledge that was passed down from, from people, you know, so like Jesus was merely human, but also a, a great human and all this stuff. 
what are your thoughts on that? Do you believe in reincarnation in this kind of like, um, you know, universal I hope, kind of truth? I hope to, I to. <laughs> mm. um, I'll be 80 next month. I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking about those kinds of things. But yeah, I, I, I would like to go around again. I've been told I had a very have a very old soul, but I don't know how they do that. But I I don't argue with people. My my grandmother, my mother's mother, used to talk about having inherited her family's German house brownies, and I always thought that was a bunch of guff. But okay, Grandma, if you believe it, that's fine. Until I went to one of those one of those almost. A rainbow gathering. Yeah, I think it was the first one that I went to, the one in Kentucky. And as we drove in and parked, I got out of the car and walked over to where to fill in the papers and stuff. The guy says, hi. He says, I uh, saw your little brownie sitting on your car. I think, I'm glad you brought him. And I said, say what? What are you talking about? Brownie? And all of a sudden it dawned on me what he was talking about. It was past has to be my grandma's brownies. Well, they're still with me. I can't see them. I've never been able to see them. But they take things and then, you know, when you, you know, but know where something was and it's not there. I saw that several years and years ago when, because I can't find something. I just say, okay, brownies, I've had it. I want it back and I want it now. Turn around and it's there. And I can't I mean, tell you how that happened. So I don't know. I just like I said, I I kind of fell into paganism because it answered a lot of questions I had, and it just works for me. Of course, I, I yeah, think, makes. I think, Go ahead. I think it was more the lack of negativity that I, that enchanted me in the first place because everybody was always so positive and so up, and that was good because I'd had so much bleh to to, to deal with. Right. That is something that I hear from a lot of people is that, um, I mean, all people are judgmental, but pagan religions in general don't have that kind of guilt, shame, judgment yeah. element, you know? Right. They don't, doesn't seem to be nearly so bad. Although I did to it, went into it one time in Georgia, uh, the group I was working with, this was rather late in the, in the career, and they had a daughter, uh, don't remember how old she was seven or eight she was she was not a baby but she was old enough to think you know and i showed up one time over there for a meeting with a gay friend of mine who was he was a cross dresser but he he was also a musician and his music came out that way rather than you know strictly nail this but they got right. all upset because i had brought him i dared to bring him to their house when they had a child and they knew it and i and that was the last i saw of them because i figured wow. if they were that if they were that close-minded i didn't need to be dealing with them i don't blame you that's 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 pretty shocking you know it's, well, it, was. it always blows my mind when you hear those kind of stories it, it, yeah, it blew me away. Another thing that, that I kept running into, I have never been racially prejudiced in any way. And a couple of times I was working with people who were uh, black. And there was one specific incident. My husband and I and this gentleman, the fellow that we worked with, went out to get lunch. And we went to this particular restaurant. It was it was just a fast food place, but they wouldn't serve him because he was black. And I threw their food wow. in their face and walked out, and I never went back to any of their restaurants again. Good for you. That's a, that's so crazy. I just, not, I just will not deal with it. I mean, my sister was married to a gentleman from Thailand, and that was just not a good thing either. And uh, well, it turned out to be good at, at the end. And she. Yeah, but the point is, uh, race is not was, a determining factor for you. You've never been prejudiced no, based on no. race. You judge it, people as individuals. It, yep. What are the time. As long as you do me right, I do you right, and we'll get along great. And, and if you cross me, that's the last you'll see in my tracks. Beautiful. Because I just don't, I just won't deal with it. I don't have time. I didn't have time then. I don't damn sure don't have time now. <laughs> right. So I want to ask you, though, have you ever had 
you mentioned the brownies. Have you had or ever had any other like supernatural experiences? Have you ever like, for example, talked to ghosts or seen ghosts or seen spirits or deity? I know this is a big thing I, within paganism. I saw my grandfather, Elmer, my mother's father, get on a bus in Atlanta and he turned around and waved at me twenty years after he was dead. And I know it was just a, a physical like look alike, but it wasn't because he knew me and I knew him and I was a block away. And he was getting on a bus. I can't explain it. I, I, I couldn't explain it then. I can't explain wow. it now. But I know I saw him. And John, my husband, said that he had a brother that was killed. And he came to the house that night, knocked on the door. John let him in. They had a conversation. And he left. And... John found out the next day that his brother had been killed. Oh, wow. And he couldn't tell it either. I don't know. You know, and I, I'll be the first one to admit if there's something I don't know. Right. I don't, so I then, don't try to, you know, talk talk up, oh, I, I know this about that, blah, 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 how much I know. Yeah. Right. That's the way to be, for that. sure. <laughs> Those are some intense experiences. Um, have you ever had yeah, any yeah. like um, religious experiences, like of, of the goddess or of spirits or angels or demons or anything like that? I can say honestly that I have never ever met any negative spirits, and I've been in some places that were reported to be very haunted. I I don't I never. Uh-uh. <laughs> Nothing and like as that. for angels, just most of them were human. Right. Uh, other than that, see, the closest I think I ever came to looking God in the eye was at that uh, eclipse in Atlanta. I looked at the newspaper there, and it says that it was an a it was only an annular eclipse; it wasn't a total. But it also says that it was night that the sun covered ninety nine point. Of the moon covered ninety nine point seven percent of the moon, of the sun, and we saw the Bailey's beads and the and the uh, diamond ring and the corona. It was oh wow! To this day, now I can't talk about that without. Well, you can hear it, the emotion in my voice. I. It was probably the most intense thing I ever witnessed. It was absolutely the most beautiful thing. And and it wasn't just something that you saw. You felt it because immediately the the, the, the light the, the sun goes out like the lights go like the, going down at night and it gets dark and this breeze comes up the back of your head and the temperature drops ten or fifteen degrees, nothing flat like walking into a freezer. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Ever, ever. Don't miss. Where do you live in Canada, anyway? I'm living um, at the Great Lakes, basically um, in between Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, right on the border oh, of Michigan. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know where that is. I've been to Lake Erie. I think that's the only one of the Great Lakes I've ever got to. I was born within a hundred miles of Lake Superior, of course, in Illinois. I'm in the Lake Champlain in New York, and that's where they see the Champy monster. My sister and I were there the day after that it had been seen. Unfortunately, we didn't see it. We looked, but we didn't see it. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, there's so much mystery around these parts of the world, you know? I mean, there's mysteries everywhere. Oh, yeah. That's the thing. Oh, yeah. Well, like so, Oak Island. I've known about Oak Island since I was in junior in high school. Oh, what's your experience? Tell, tell us more about your experience with Oak Island. That's interesting. Well, it was just that I, I happened to pick up the re original Reader's Digest that had an article in it about Oak Island. And I was fascinated at the time. Wow, this is cool, you know. And then years later, well, now even, they're, they're out there trying to figure out what's still what's going on. Yeah, that sh there's a TV show yeah. that's been ongoing on the History Channel oh, now. It has, like, 30 seasons. Yeah. 
my speculation is that I believe that if there there probably was treasure at Oak Island, but it has been since taken, you know? Yeah, who knows? They'll either right? find it's it or they would <laughs> But uh, that, and, and the funny thing is, my sister and I would drove up through uh, Maine. She's living in New Hampshire, so we drove up through Maine and into Nova Scotia one year and went right past Oak, Oak Island to go Peggy's Cove. Oh, I nice. Thought. And I've been to Halifax, and I flew out of Labrador, out of uh, Goose Bay. When oh, I went wow, to, you've been way up north. <laughs> oh, I've been further north than that. I've been, I've been above the Arctic Circle to Tromso, Norway, where my youngest son is living. Incredible. Yeah, So, and I've been across the equator in Indonesia. I've been to Bali and Jakarta and the whole of Long Island. Oh, and beautiful. I've been to some crazy places. I'm, as an American, I and during the the for mid years, I've been to Can I've been to Cuba. <laughs> what was what was Cuba like during the blockades? Oh, well, I did get off the airport. <laughs> I was only there okay. an hour. <laughs> All right, but I have been to Cuba. Wow! And I've been yeah, to down to uh, Mexico to Chichen Itza and Zibalcantun and and uh, all those deep places. That was fascinating. All the way down into Guatemala, we went. Oh wow! And I've been. I've been. I've seen. I've seen uh, lots of volcanoes. Uh, been to Surtsey Island when it was first coming up off, off of Iceland. That's when I flew to Germany, and the plane circled it. We saw this little island smoking out of the water. When I was in Indonesia, we went to Bro like, up onto Mount Bromo, which is a huge volcano there, and it was smoking and carrying on that day. I've been to. There was a, a one, in, one in Guatemala that we saw. I can't remember. And I've been to earthquakes. I've been the first earthquake. I was in San Francisco. No, Los Angeles. The whole building was shaking. on it. what the hell is that? Must be an earthquake. <laughs> I wanna, yeah. What I want to know, Mariah, is how did you become a spiritual teacher in someone who's kind of like, you know, you're fa you had this famous website, you were writing all of this stuff, and you treat you trained people and initiated people like Buffy. How does that come about? I just, day to day, doing what comes. I don't know. I never, I went, never went looking for any of it. It just found me. I, I don't know what else to tell you but that. I mean, I, 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 I never really wanted to be a teacher, but People keep asking, kept asking me things. When we lived in Tampa, we had a, a oh, yeah, the fellow that I went to Ravenwood with. Uh, we had a little study group there in, in Tampa and would come over one night a week and we would discuss, you know, pagan things. And I don't know, I've lost track of all of them over the years, but in the course of things, I've started several covens. We had, we decided to, in Georgia, because kudzu covers everything, we, we called the cousin. We called our coven kudzu squared because circles, of course, round, of course. So we had to be different. And we had Foxfire and we had, and I don't even know all of them, but over the years that I've started, whether any of them still exist, I don't know. It would be great. But if not, that's okay, too. I, I don't know. So, so what was your first experience like with the coven? How did you wind up getting becoming like this kind of coven leader? It's, it's such an interesting role to, to define oneself in, you know? Well, it was nothing I was set out looking for. People just kept finding me. And then years and years later, well, it was after I had all those, gosh, Jimmy, I don't know. I, you're going to have to let me think about that one. I don't really, I can't, the only thing I can say is people kept asking me questions and I had sort of answers. It just sort of happened, I guess. I did go right. looking for it, that's for sure. Because I was raising five kids and working a full-time job. Which is amazing. Uh, the fact that you were able to do all of these things, be all of these people. Wow. <laughs> well, it just sort of happened, I guess. I don't know. But maybe maybe, maybe there is something to destiny. Right. Yes, we have choices, but in the long run, do we? That's a good point. That's a good. That's a good. That's a, that's an interesting thing, right? You know, that's a, one of the conundrums of life. I know yeah. a lot of various pagan traditions. They don't believe in fate, or well, I'm sorry, they don't believe in chance. Everything is fated. 
you know? What it's is your perspective both. on fate? I, I definitely think it's both. You think it's both? I think you can, you can be open to chance, you know, a chance meeting or, a, or a, an offer of a job or a, you know, whatever, and things just happen sometimes, but sometimes they they come because of what you are and what you do, and you know, and sometimes there isn't any reason, it just happens. So I don't know, I, I, I believe in fate, but I don't leave my life to it, you know, I think I stood, still should be standing behind the wheel. It's amazing, you know, because I'm talking to you as someone who lived a life as a spiritual and religious leader. And you seem to be so kind of, um, you know, no, I mean, open and going with the flow. Like, do you hold any like firm beliefs about these There's kind no of things? Or like, what, your, what's your... hey, hey, we're, if, if we're, if, well, if we propose to believe in the goddess, right? And and my definition of her has always been Mother Earth. And, and the, the, the living, the life itself on Earth is all of the goddess. But she rules everything, the weather, the volcanoes, the hurricanes, the rain, the, you know, everything. So if you, where was I going with that? If, I don't see how people can deny climate change, for instance, or advances in medicine or anything else, that, you know, that just, these things just, they don't just happen. People make them happen, but and then again, why and how? And I just sort of have always kind of rolled along with what, like I said, what works, what comes. You deal with what comes, and you do what you do, and you get what you get. So would it be fair then? It seems you're very much a practical down, like down to earth, right? You believe in the earth itself, and oh, yeah. religion is kind of a natural out. A natural expression of the natural world, almost. Yeah, that's that's pretty much definition, I think. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, I didn't mention before but, uh, that years ago there was something called the EST training, E S T, and I can't remember what it stands for, but I took it and learned a hell of a lot. And that's where I got the thing about deal with what is, don't worry about what isn't. Deal with what is. If you handle what is, and, and 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 you let things be what they are and what they're not, then you know how to interact with them. Yeah, I'm 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 very much down to earth. <laughs> I don't need so, to be yeah. So EST is kind of like um, thought training, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what it stood for. I'm, I'll have to look it up and I'll let you know. But it was That's called S. Yes, he and I can't even. And the, the guy that I took the it was in Atlanta, and the guy I took it with was the guy that had started it. I haven't heard much about it in years, but it I heard a lot of people did it, and then they did another thing later, kind of a workshop thing, and I did that too. They were both very, very uh, practical and very helpful, and I th I still think the best one of the best things I learned from them and also from the world is deal with what is something is either is or it isn't deal with it that way not not the could should have what is could is you know what is and what isn't right that's beautiful that really builds off of that earlier thing we we're talking about do what is right you know of the yeah. universal church yeah love it yeah and what is right is what is helpful to you and to the people around you if you need your help they'll ask for it or you'll know that they need it and you must give it freely and willingly. And then 99 times out of 100, you get that back. Sometimes you don't. I mean, you know, there's assholes out there in every, yeah. in every religion. <laughs> of course. That's life, right? You know, and, you know, oh, yeah. we all are selfish at times. You know, it's, it's the nature of humanity, we, the we nature have, of life. We, mu we must be selfish enough to keep ourselves going and our batteries charged and be true to what we believe and what we think and live that and given that i don't think that there is such anything that's you know a, a horrible sin that you can't get over i mean steal something from somebody admit it give it back you know right but don't be telling lies don't be trying to smirch somebody's reputation don't treat people meanly don't be particularly do not 
mistreat, mistreat children. They ask questions, oh. answer them honestly at whatever level they are able to understand. No, I love that. That's such a that's a, such a good thing, right? Respect is so important, especially for ch- oh. children who are learning. You know, and you have Very. to respect everyone's, you know, individuality well, they, and what they desire. You know. Yes, and so much of of what we have as potential is beaten out of us by society that by the children are almost all creative geniuses but by the time they get out of high school or become adults it's all gone there's maybe one or two percent that are still and they think now i said was watching something on the on the thing today about the theta waves and if you can redirect and re up your theta waves in your brain that you could get that back i hope wow. i never lost it but i know an awful lot of people who do and it did right now that's such an important thing i feel like the central part of childhood is the is imagination and the freedom to yes. be you yeah. know the kids have with their thoughts and so often right. our school tells them it's don't think like that. That's stupid. Don't be creative. Uh, yeah, well, the, teachers, find you the, a buck. the schools do it. The parents do it. The churches do it. The cops do it. Everybody breathes it, beats it out of us until we're just the. Uh, You're so right. You know, and it's so unfortunate. Everybody doesn't call anymore. Wow. Yeah, we don't. We don't dream. We don't. We we don't even put any stock into any of that kind of stuff. Right. You know, and we should because it all real and it works. Yeah, I mean, fifty percent of our lives are going to be spent in the dream world. You're going to just ignore that. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Disney's Disney movie. What was that? Something about if you. Oh, I can't remember. It was a song in one of the Disney movies. Something about if you believe what you do. Did we leave? Did we lose Mariah? I think we lost her. We were doing so well. <laughs> I know. I know. There she goes. Okay, so let's call her back. Uh, long time no talkie <laughs> <laughs> because there she is are you back mariah can we hear you Hear are you oh, okay yeah we can hear you now so let I us know when we're good to start again um uh, buffy okay we're good i don't know where we got to so y'all have to tell me <laughs> but i'm just shooting <laughs> oh yeah we'll just we'll just we'll just jump and continue i want to ask you since you were, you know, you led these covens and you were teaching people magic, what is your perception of magic? And how does the magic process work for you? Like, what were you teaching your students and how how does it work? For me, I think one of the best explanations I ever got of, of how to do magic is to be very clear about what you're trying to do. Even sometimes write it all down if necessary in as many details as possible what you want and then and here's the hard part forget it let it go completely and don't pull it back into your mind again because it's like magic is like a balloon if you let go of it it'll rise and fly away and go where it's supposed to and do what it's supposed to do but if you don't let go of that string it can't right i see what you're meaning because so much of magic especially like chaos magic which is kind of the the the, the school that i come from there's all of these thought stopping techniques you know yeah techniques are are, they're important you know like anything else you have to go to if you got to learn how to swim you got to learn how to swim and how to put on a bathing suit for what water feels like and all that stuff i mean you have to explore but the idea in chaos magic is that you're trying to you're trying to get you're trying to move past your conscious mind and trying to project these ideas into your subconscious and you're trying to let your subconscious internalize them and project that will naturally right, right. whereas the mind the active mind if it interferes will overthink things and will prevent True. the magic True. from materializing well, that's exactly what i mean define right. it and then forget it and i do mean completely out of mind, gone. Because if you hang on to it, it can't work. Right. So, have you ever worked with sigil magic? Because this, to me, sounds like the roots of chaos and sigil magic. But that's almost a little before your time, or after your time. Sorry. What do you mean, uh, sigil? Just 
the drawing, the, the shapes of drawing things, or like cartography? or Yeah, so like there's that famous magician, Austin Oseman Spar, and one of the types of magic that he popularized was you would take your will, which you reduce into like, you take your, what do you want to happen? You know, your will, you reduce that right. to a statement, like, I want right. to become right. 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 And then you would, That's what I said, I divide it all. Right, and then you exactly, and then you would transform that statement into an image, a sigil, you know. Oh, well, if it helps, work, whatever works, go for it. And then you take, yeah, and then you do the idea with Austin Spar's magic is you project this image into your mind's eye, and then you're supposed to engage in sort of like an ecstatic release, either through meditation or pain, or sex, but there has yeah, to be well, kind of that thought stop that occurs. And, 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 yeah, well, that's what exactly what I mean when I say define it and then forget it. Let it go. Because, again, with that, if you, if you don't have that energy release, sex, or, like, whatever, how can it go? It's still tied to you. That's a good point. You have to let the energy flow. Yeah, it's almost like you have to send your your thoughts out into the universe. They can't be just stuck with you. Exactly, exactly. But if you, if it, if it, if it, if it works to to, to physically imagine your thoughts in a rocket ship and you send it out past the, past the sun and all the way past Pluto and up into the Oort cloud, hey, go for it. Hey, if it works, it works. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. No, that's such a that's such a modern perspective on magic. Um, this idea of if it works, it works, you know, Yeah, <laughs> I love that. But the thing is that, you know, too many people spend too much time in the definition of what they want rather than the release to the powers and let them do what they do. Right. That's a good point. That's a fair point. You know, it's like you get in a boat and you want to go someplace. Well, you're either going to have to row or come up on the wind or catch a current. But if you just sit there and do nothing, nothing happens. Right. And then do you have any experiences or anything you could talk about, about like successful magical workings where they've like where what you set out to achieve, you managed to achieve? I'd have to <laughs> say our probably the strongest uh, yeah. one we did was getting her away from her ex-husband. Oh, wow. Yeah. That sounds like powerful magic, beautiful stuff. Yeah. Well, it got me my third degree. <laughs> and I did that. Buffy and I did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it worked. It did work. It and the did thing work. was, Buffy, or Snappy, the gentleman that I'm married to now that I moved over here to be with, I had known him through the we were pen, we were pen pals because we both collect seashells. Oh, cute. And so we had been pen pal and short, you know, trading packages of shells and letters back and forth for like some seven years I think and then when things blew up there and I really needed to get away with the situation I was in Buffy and I went out back there in Atlanta which does place is not there anymore I don't think or not Atlanta but Knoxville and uh, I don't even remember exactly what we did but it worked because I, I, I had never expected to hear from him again because I, the last letter I had gotten said uh, well, my wife has has just died, and I don't want to be alone, but I don't think I'm going to be, you know, doing this seashell thing for a while. And okay, so I, okay, well, fine. I'll probably never hear from him again. And the minute that Buffy and I did this thing, uh, I got another another letter from him and said, "Hey, you want to keep trading?" I said, "Sure." He says, "Well, you know." Um, I think I don't want to live the rest of my life alone, and we seem to get along pretty well. Uh, can can we meet? And he came over uh, to Atlanta, uh, to Knoxville there, and, and we met. And when he, by the time he went back, he had asked me to marry him. And here That's I am, beautiful. twenty years later. What a beautiful story! Amazing. Mm-hmm. 
Do you remember well, what you guys did, Buffy? Well, it involved my dark elf. I had a, a figure of the dark elf from uh, World of Warcraft. She was like a doll of mine. I had I played with dolls then oh, yeah, in my that. 20s. You remember her? Yeah, so I did a lot of doll magic and figurine magic. And she was my huntress. And I just talked to her and asked her to please go and find Mariah, the perfect man that would give her everything she needed and everything that her heart desired and to remove her from this horrible bad situation that she was in it was more heart and soul than than fancy words or crazy movements like any any magic I've ever done that worked was heart and soul it wasn't sigils or incense or anything it was just purely it come from me you have to put your you have to put the energy into it that's yeah. for sure yeah, so it wasn't anything super fancy. I mean, we did have candles and incense, and I'm sure we wrote yeah, something down and burnt it. But uh, I can't remember anything specific. No, I just know right, it worked. Right, yeah, it worked. So, you know. But it's interesting, though. You were, you know, I, you know, people should know, though, it's things like doll magic. That's really powerful. That's idol magic. You were creating basically an egregore spirit. That then worked on your behalf. Yeah. Right. I think that I kind of like feel about that, like my German house brownies. I mean, like I said, I don't see them. Yeah. But I know they're still here. Yeah. Because at least very, once very a week, we to fuss at them. And, or and I ask about things like weather, you know, uh, such and such and so. I like to have nice rain or nice weather this day. You rain, you rain the day before and rain the day after, but not this day. And usually, not always, of course, but usually. It works. And another thing I wanted to ask you about is that, like, on your website, and I've seen some of your art, you're you're a very incredible jewelry designer and artist. How does that relate to, to your magical practice? Because it seems so related. That's a good question, dear. I'm not sure I can have an answer for that. I've been carving since I was six years old, and my mother trusted me with a sharp knife. And I've been painting almost that long. She painted my all my... My home, both sides of my family was painters. I think I'm the only sculptor. It, it just seems like something that comes easy to me. It's, you know, it's like people are born with math capabilities and some people are born with musical capabilities and some of them have, some people have half a dozen things and that just happened to be one of mine. I don't know. Can you, I, 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 well, the first time I was chatting with you, you told me this really amazing story where you had carved something for an indigenous native gentleman, and he was so moved yeah. by it that then you then were invited into the tribe, and they welcomed you as a full member. Yeah, and gave me a Native American name. That's Blangheart. Heart. That's where I got that. That's in that picture that I sent, the, the lame bear type. Beautiful. Can show you that? Yes, we'll make sure to show it in the video right here. Okay, and his his name was Lame Bear, and he I asked him. I said, he said, because I had another pipe that I had carved, and it was a grizzly bear. And he said, I I've been the chief of the bear clan for such and such and so and so, and that's the most lifelike bear I've ever carved out of stone. And I thanked him, you know, he it makes me feel good. But then he wanted one, and that, that's what he got. And I, he he was his name was Lame Bear, and he was. He visualized himself dragging his left hind foot, which you notice the bear is doing. And I had a parrot at the time, and I had to keep her claws cut because she was would tear things up. So when I would trip her nails, I would save them. And when I got a chance to do that pipe for him, I mounted in the foot. You can see him there. The uh, claws from the ferret, which of course put her spirit and mine into his pipe. Wow. I guess he figured it was a. I guess he figured it was a, a, a ferret, and he paid me, paid me well. He paid me two hundred dollars for that pipe. But and that was another thing that I that I I always wanted some. I wanted catlinite. I wanted to carve catlinite, sacred pipe stone, and I didn't know where the hell I was going to ever find any. And somebody and I right off the top of my head can't think of how that came about. But somebody knew somebody that lived on this property where there was a, light, a, a vein of it that came up. And it's only on this one particular Indian reservation that, that there is any, except for this one other guy that owns property that bots up to that. And he was selling it. And I, I think I bought 50 pounds the first time. 
had carved up almost all of it. Love the stuff. It's beautiful. It's soft enough to do with a, lo- a knife if you've got a long time or files or whatever. Or you can use, uh, you know, like Dremel tools, like dental things. Somebody told me once, well, none of our ancestors would have caught Oh, they did everything by hand. I said, uh-huh. And are you honestly going to stand here and tell me that if they had a Dremel and electricity that they would spend months and years carving a piece when they could do it in a couple of weeks and it have it be better? Right. Than do it at I totally agree. Think so. I they think would not silly. have wasted the time. To, yeah, exactly. That was so silly. Right. It makes me think about, like, like I'm a huge fan of um, Renaissance art. And there's this huge uh, debate about... Uh-huh. Which painters used camera obscura, which is like a type of um, yeah, yeah, I know what it is. yeah, right. a projected image so that you can trace the image. And my right. thoughts are, they probably all used it. <laughs> sure, why not? Like, exactly, why not? right? That's and does it even matter? Hard, like, I'm a draftsman. I, I I have done some incredibly intricate drawings, but they're nothing. They're they're, they're just lines on paper. They are not real. What's real is what you do with it. That's such a beautiful I, point. I got to tell you about this little, one little girl I thought I was going to... She came up to me at a, at a pagan gathering. I can't tell the who you was or anything, but she came up to me and she said, well, you know, I'm a vegetarian. And I said, well, that's that's fine, dear. If you believe in that, that's like more power to you. And she says, yeah, but... Everybody else is not, and 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 uh, if they would if everybody would stop eating meat, the animals would stop eating each other. And I said, "And you honestly believe that? Go away." <laughs> yeah, that's a ser- serious really, naivety, right? Exactly, exactly. But it's you interesting. Know, bit- what I want to ask you is, when you were doing your art. And you're carving. Do you ever, like, one thing, like, I know, like, I'm a musician. I'm a percussionist. And part of the reason why I got into spirituality and magic is just that feeling of entering into those flow states where I don't feel like I'm creating. I feel like something is creating through me. And it's like a spiritual experience. Have you ever had anything like that? Oh, we may have lost her again, Buffy. Hey. It is a possibility. It is storming here too, just to let you know it's a good it's a it's a decent storm. Okay, I'll try to call yeah. her back and call I'm you back. Here. Oh, she's oh, here. You're here. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm back. I, it, it, it it was digging at me, so I figured I got lost again. Yeah, well I'm glad you're back. So we'll, we'll we'll just ask you a couple more questions and we'll wind down here since Buffy's getting stormy. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you about is when you are engaging in your art, do you ever find that to be like a spiritual or magical experience? Do you ever enter into flow states? Oh, yes, absolutely. If it doesn't, if it, and, and if I don't get to that point of feeling when I'm, when I'm doing it, I quit because it's not going to go, it'll, it'll break or it'll, you know, and you always have to be willing to change what your idea was because of the, medium you're working with the stone it's easy to tell there's a crack i gotta go around that or a knot in the wood hmm can i use that or do i have to go around it and eliminate it you know you, you work again you work with what is and i lost them again no for sure yeah you work you work with what oh, is okay. right and you have yeah. to you have to as an artist you kind of have to bring the soul of that whatever you're working with out it seems right like. And so, if, like, when you, you know, choose a rock, do you see the image in the rock first? Or do you start carving yeah. a rock and then the rock becomes the image? Both. Both. I, I, pick up, I, I pick up a piece of stone and I look for what's in there. And I talk to it and it will tell me. I'm a fish. I'm a, 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 a bird. I'm a whatever. And then I, with that in mind... And working, you know, that that I'm working with the feeling of the thing itself, then I can bring out what's in there. But if it's not in there, I can't turn it into something else. I mean, if if it's a frog and it wants to be a frog, it's going to be a frog, or it's going to be just a clump of, you know, untouched stone, or or, or you know, you you can't force it. 
art, right. art is about one of those things. It just doesn't doesn't work that way. No, you're right. It doesn't work that way. And a lot of people are amazed by people who can enter into these states like you can. How would you, you know, what what advice would you give to those people who wish to do art from this kind of perspective of flow? Uh, to have an idea where you're going, because that's always a good idea, where you're trying to go with something, with a painting or a carving, but be willing to let it talk to you and tell you where it wants to go, and then you find the happy road between. Uh, I don't know. A conversation, really, right? And about quite, yeah, yeah, more more like that, and I, I don't know how else to say that. I don't think I've ever tried to explain that. Well, this is, you know, a lot of artists have trouble explaining this kind of part, you know, because it is something that's almost counterintuitive that comes naturally, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. Well, like, for instance, uh, also with, with the stone, but also like with wood, for instance, you find a lovely piece of wood, you can, you can buy a block of Coco Bolo from anybody and pay a $20 of, you know, a pound for it or whatever, and to totally, totally ruin it by not looking at it in terms of where the, where the, uh, oh, come on, where the grain is, what the shape of it, if it still has a natural shape, you can go from there, but if it's just a block, you gotta see what you can come out of it, and all the, for instance, if you had a piece of, of ebony, mm-hmm. uh, which is black, you would not necessarily want, well, you know, why not? You could tie the swan. <laughs> but, you know, have some idea of the ideas that the color or the shape or the feel sets off in you as you're working it, and then let, the, let those things lead you. Right, and then learning to adapt as you discover more and more of the of the wood or the stone as you carve into it right and the closer you get to finished and know when to quit right For instance, with, with sculpting 99 people 99 people out of 100 who ever try to carve anything they cut car- they quit way too soon they don't take off near enough and then if they don't do that then they take off too much and they just wind up with a toothpick <laughs> right you know so interesting and i i i've collected i have some of my favorite pieces were were wood that i've passed all to my son but that i got in various places there's a really magical place in new hampshire called the oh come on is it called something some, something mountain i'll think of it. but anyway i've got a beautiful piece of wood from up there that I just found, you know, on the laying on the ground. It was pine, pine, and it turned into a beautiful Nessie, uh, you know, the Loch Ness monster. And she's oh, cool. got her, she's got her head rear up, way high on her, on her long neck, and she's looking you in the eye with this big grin on her face, and her one flipper is up across her breast, like. I'm beautiful. Look at me. <laughs> I love that. And it was almost there before I ever picked it up, much less started working with it. Right. Uh, so, I mean, you have to learn to, to read it. Now, art of painting and drawing is a little different. It's a little more technical. Yes and no, but uh, I guess it's the same because if you if you do too much, you it won't work. And if you don't do enough, it won't work. You have to know right. when to quit, but don't quit too soon. <laughs> Such an interesting idea, you know, when you're conceiving of these kind of artistic things and trying uh-huh. to create a whole piece. And, you know, and that's really good advice, learning to go with the flow and learning to quit on, and when to stop or when to do more. It's all about that right. balance, right? And yeah. it is a conversation, yeah. right? You're having a conversation with the medium whether it's wood uh-huh. or stone or paper or what have you. I think too many people go into art thinking they are going to whip this thing into shape. I'm going to do it. I'm going to paint the such and such and such and such. 
Well, maybe. First, you got to learn about it, do drafting. But well, that's such an important then, thing. Like learning the oh, same yeah. geometry, right? That's one of the things, like, uh, Buffy and I have a friend, um, Ryan Seven, who's like an occult researcher. And his uh -huh. big thing lately has been exploring the sacred geometry within the it tarot. Is so, it is so important. Right? And what's wild, yeah, though, is that you start to find that within the tarot, all of this, these geometrical patterns and the astrology yeah. and the axes and the nature of the earth, all of those num and all of that numbers are encoded in there. Yeah, and you talk about your old masters, the painters. Almost all of yeah. those are built on on uh, perfect geometry, stars and and squares and rectangles and triangles and all. But they're all solid geometry. They're not just an attempt at a square. Right, and you're, you're not just you're not just is, drawing what you see. You're you're drawing. You're putting what you see into a grid. Right. right, right, absolutely. It's almost like you have to create the universe before you can start painting with a lot of that more well, sacred you, stuff. You, you have to be aware of it. If you're painting yeah. flowers, for instance, if you're going to paint a, a, a sunflower, for instance, okay, the basic flower itself is basic, mostly round. The yellow petals come out to a pretty good circle. But the middle, where all the star, where all the seeds are, is some very intricate and very uh, spirals, like uh, right. seashells. I think that's one thing that got me into the seashells was all the math in them. And if you it, once you get that right, you, if you painted, for instance, if you painted a, a flower that has a five point symmetry, and you get the colors right, and do and even make the leaves look more or less, if you don't have that five pointed star no matter how you want to bend it into three dimensions if you don't have that symmetry right nobody is ever going to recognize it as that kind of a flower True. because that kind of a flower has that kind of geometry yeah and there's something magical about that geometry too right there's a reason why nature chooses to unfurl itself in this way sure, because it works one yeah. is alone two oh that's us and three, we are, et cetera, et cetera. Beautiful. You know, and without, without that concepts, uh, I just, I don't know. I don't know how people ever do anything, really, and, and make art out of, out of it. If they don't do those kind of things or know those kind of things. That's yeah. Like, you wow. know, how would you, draw, how would you draw a beach ball? You could make a circle and call it a ball, but if you didn't have the, 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 curves on the surface right it would never appear to be three-dimensional good point so to wind up here what do you think is the connection between art magic and spirituality they're all the same they they're are all the same. one yeah beautiful can you elaborate on what you mean uh, i thought that's what we've been doing for an hour <laughs> <laughs> But I get what you're uh, saying, right? Like, they're all intrinsically related. Like, there is no art without spirituality, right? And there is right. no magic without right. art. <laughs> right. Wow. There's no, That's so beautiful. You can have math without art, but hard. It's difficult. That's where people give up on math because I don't understand it. Because they can't visualize it. Once you get it in the head, in the geometry, plain geometry first and then solid geometry then you begin to understand what things are and how they look and how they act and and then it's easier to do but if you don't understand it how can you possibly do it you can't create something you don't understand good point wow. even children even <laughs> children that i think i think we, we talked earlier about what was right what were sins i think one of the biggest sins that had can possibly be done to another person is to lie to a child yeah. about anything because they're, those minds are open and they'll take what you tell them and they'll unfortunately believe it. And when it doesn't turn, turn out to be true, whereas it, it, that leaves them up the creek, but it kind of leaves you out, off in a corner because they won't ask you anymore. 
Yeah. And, and sometimes people may have even the worst reaction, whereas they were, they know it's a lie, but the lie gives them comfort. And right. the lie was told to them by those they love. And so they right. cling to it. And they attack yeah. anything that, that, that shows it for what it is, a lie. Because, because they are not willing to see what is. Yeah. They see it could be, would be, could we, could be, you know, maybe, all that stuff, not what is. Deal with what is and you won't have those problems. Of course, it's difficult and sometimes to realize what's not, what is. And then, like you say, people don't want to admit what is. They don't want to face but, what is. This is yeah. such a key thing for me in my personal life, my personal philosophy was <laughs> recognizing, you know, so much of our mythology and so much of our stories are about coping with the harshness and the absurdity of our reality. They're coping mechanisms, you know? Yeah. But in a sense, they provide almost a cage oftentimes because they distort the they reality. Do more, they do more harm than they do good because as long as you're caught up in the on the in the unreality, how can you manifest it into reality? Whatever it is. Exactly. Right? If you can't face what's in front of you, then how do you move forward? You can't. <laughs> You're stuck. Exactly. And so much of life, like I feel like the, looking at the natural world and looking at Mother Nature, this goddess energy, to me, the clearest message, the only command is to adapt, to learn to grow Amen. and change. Right? Amen. That is why the human beings have taken over this planet, because we are the most adaptable creature that she's ever come up with 100 percent. after all we got we are goddess but when when we stop learning to, to adapt then we start we get we get ourselves into trouble right we start to stagnate and there's a huge reality that i feel like so many of us ignore right and it's like if we can't change and learn to grow and adapt then she will the remake way. us into something else humanity that will too. stop and something yeah. will replace us, you know, yeah. that will and be able to adapt. adapt. As individuals, if we can't learn to adapt, then we are not we're going to be stuck in, our, in this one life and we're not going to accomplish anywhere near what we should have or could have right. if we just stop fighting. I guess, I guess it all comes, a lot of that comes down to pick your battles. Yeah. But you know, I'm, you know there's, there's a couple of key things of talking with you that I feel we can leave our audience with. Learn to face reality and deal with what is. Do oh, what man. is right and accept responsibility. And learn right. to work in the flow of the natural world. Right, right. Like, you don't go to catch, to dig clams at high tide. Exactly. You know, do things when they're appropriate, time of the year, time of day, time of the situation, time of the, you know, president, dear God. <laughs> Oh, that man, yeah. he killed me. I hope, I, here's, here's, I, I, I may not be a Buddhist, but I'm a firm believer in, in karma, and I don't want to be in his shoes or anywhere near him, because That's he is going to sure. get it by the load. That I fully, fully agree with. So let's end it there, Mariah. Uh, this was okay. so much fun. We'll definitely do yeah, another conversation, well, you know. In, in some, there's lots of things we can talk about and do. Well, one thing Buffy and I were talking about that we really want to do is a witches symposium where we get a bunch of, you know, it would be her and I plus our elders, you, Gypsy, and maybe a couple uh -huh. other ladies. And then we could listen uh -huh. to your wisdom. And that would, I think, and, and get you guys to talk with one another. I think that would be really rewarding for people. Yeah. But, and there's just a thought that went through when you said that, don't don't avoid or not think of the uh, male witches because there's plenty of them. Oh, you know, of course, everybody thinks so. witches are female and they're not. No, that's very true. So we have, like, so I've been doing this thing called the Witches Symposium and uh -huh. it's mostly actually been men on there just because uh -huh. of the people I know and who want to talk. But we're hoping uh -huh. to bring... You know, one of the things, like, you're right, preconception that it's mostly women, but at the same time, if I'm being honest, women don't get to speak as much, especially older That's women right. like yourself. That's right. And, People don't, you know, we don't know anything. I feel, How could they know anything? 
<laughs> well, I just got a huge education here, and I love this talk with you. You have so much wisdom to offer. So, you know, that's what we want to do. Well, we want to expose I'm, I'm, people like you. <laughs> I'm glad that it's that it's useful. Uh, that's good to know, and it also validates the things that I've learned the hard way. Yeah, you know, of course. So yeah, course. Sharing, sharing is is so very important in everything we do, and in everything we don't do. Because if we can't share, when we're talking about art, you can share techniques, you can share ideas, you can share knowledge, you can share. You know, this brush is better than that for this kind of a stroke, and I mean, you know, down to fine technical details like that and it's all important but if you don't have anybody to share it with means you have to find it out by knocking yourself against the wall by yourself and you may indeed discover some wonderful things but you also miss a lot this is the beauty of humanity this is the beauty of humanity is that we can learn from others one of the most eye-opening things i ever learned about was when i was studying art in university we can pinpoint the moment in the renaissance when in italy they discovered how to paint with perspective and yeah. we can trace how that idea within less than a uh-huh. hundred years goes from italy to everywhere on earth right, right? So because something that was in the way that they really look right but something that people couldn't figure out then one person figured it out and everyone figured it out like that's beautiful that's called the hundredth monkey the hundredth, the hundredth monkey effect is once that one monkey learns to do something are there other monkeys all around him or her they learn to do that particular thing and then they'd all do it right and, and that's magic it that people and it works with people too well we can but see like, it just clearly like on display there. right in yeah. history when you study your history like i said with art perspective we can also do it with right. the um the chariot the horse-drawn chariot conquered oh, yeah. the entire world right yep but right. we can pinpoint it to a single spot in northern asia and then boom yep. everywhere <laughs> oh yeah well let's let's face it we still have there are still wheels out there to invent 100 percent. 100 percent. i think that's the end note right there that's great <laughs> perfect <Yep. Okay>. thank <laughs> you for, 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 <laughs> that was for, like there's still I'm wheels so out there to invent yes ma'am Yes, ma'am. As a chief, she knows how to tell me when to shut up play peacefully <laughs> <laughs> and politely. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Love you, too. Miss you so much. Thank you so much for this, uh, Mariah. This was enlightening. Mm-hmm. That was fun. <laughs>